Welcome to State of the Net. Thanks for having me here. The, the I want to say something before you go. Go ahead. Even though you're moderating. It's a real <laughs> pleasure to be here. It's, you know, normally you wouldn't have an EEOC commissioner here. You don't know my world that well, and I don't know your world. But look, an innovative technology here is bringing me to discuss an area that's impacting all of us. So first, I really appreciate having someone else other than an FTC, FCC commissioner that you're used to hearing from. So thank you at the outset. It's our pleasure. Uh, also, really quickly, 20 years of State of the Net. I think uh, Tim Lorden deserves a big round of applause. 20 years. <clears throat> Workday, um, Workday has sponsored this conference every year since uh, we stood up our DC office for the last uh, five years, and it's always a great time. So here we have diverse perspectives. I want to start with an easy one, uh, Commissioner Sonderling, which is for all of the budding uh, EEOC commissioners in the audience now. Um, we heard a little bit about your background, but how does one... How does one wake up one day as a commissioner uh, at the EEOC? Well, there's something wrong with you first if you <laughs> want to take one of these jobs. But, you know, I was a labor and employment lawyer. I started government service at the Department of Labor in 2017 and uh, now here at the EEOC. So this is what I've done. It gives me a very unique perspective on a unique area of law, which impacts every single industry. Um, as long as you have employees, we're involved in that. And our agency deals with some of the most fundamental civil rights we have in this country, which is the ability to enter and thrive in the workforce and not be discriminated against based upon your protected characteristics, such as race, sex, national origin, um, et cetera. And as we'll discuss, technology is now having such an impact on workers' ability to enter and thrive in the workforce, provide for their families, because at some point, everyone is going to be judged uh, by an algorithm when it comes to the workplace. That's a great segue to, to an opening question, which is, and you sort of mentioned it in, in your initial remarks, which is EEOC is not, uh, you know, we tend to think about commerce. There's a bunch of agencies we think of when we think of of tech, uh, a, federal involvement in tech issues. EEOC doesn't spring to mind, but yet um, you, you've done a really nice job of positioning the EEOC and sharing thoughts. Can you talk a little bit about why, particularly the AI issue, is so front and center for you? Because we really have to. If you think about the EEOC, we really kind of go with the direction of where employment trends are going. So when the Me Too movement happened, we had to be out there front and center and help employers deal with firing CEOs, firing board members, et cetera. Then COVID happened and we were dealing with workplace accommodations and vaccines. Then the women's soccer team case came about and we were dealing with pay equity. So there's always gonna be something that drives the agency with employment trends. But from when I got there, I said, well, what is the future? How do we stop for a minute and say, how do we prevent those large scale issues that it's gonna impact all industries, all all employees and all employers. And that's really when I started hearing about artificial intelligence in the workplace. And that's when I thought to myself, well, you know, I don't see any robots out there yet actually replacing workers. And so much of the time was about automation and actually having workers be replaced by physical robots. And okay, well, that only impacts certain industries like manufacturing or retail or logistics. And taking a step back, and that's when I learned that AI had been involved in the job decision-making process for years. And employers, large organizations, small organizations have been using some sort of artificial intelligence, machine learning, natural language process through the employee, entire employee life cycle. From the very beginning to make a job description, to advertisements, to reviewing resumes, to actually conducting the interview, to determining who's gonna get a job offer, to determining that person's salary. Um, and then when you get to be an employee, doing your performance reviews, seeing if you should get promoted, demoted. And there's even some software out there that will tell you you're getting fired. So when I dove into it, I said, wow, this is already out there. It's already happening. And this is the future. So we need to get involved now because there's a lot of benefits to this software. As you all know, the biggest issue in human resources happens to be the human. That's the reason my agency exists. That's why we bring all our cases, and that's why we get hundreds of thousands of employment discrimination inquiries every single year. So I think the difference about using AI in HR for the workforce, compared to other uses that you've been hearing about, making logistics faster, making widgets faster, you know, doing doc review, accounting, lawyers, here you're dealing, again, with civil rights. And there just needs to be an extra care and caution that goes into it based upon longstanding principles that I found employers are doing generally across the board in HR, 
But when it came to AI, because of the novelty of the software, because of all these cool new things it can do, let's just throw out that all the window and you know, potentially rely on these algorithms. So I've said consistently since I've been involved, if carefully used and properly designed, AI can actually help eliminate bias in the workforce. But all you have to do is flip that and say, if it's not carefully used or if it's improperly designed, it could potentially scale discrimination to the likes we've never seen before. And there needs to be guardrails, guidance, the whole, you know, of each use of it, I believe my agency and what we've been doing is trying to get involved in every step and saying, here, if you want to use this innovative software to make employment decisions, to assist you with employment decisions, you can. It's a free country. Go ahead. But for each potential use of it, whether it's in hiring, whether it's in salary, whether it's performance reviews, here are the potential ways it can eliminate bias, and here's the potential harms. And you have to look at that at such a it's individualized use of it. And I really think that's where we've been able to lead and talk about those specific issues so employers can integrate this and people can innovate. I want to double down <clears throat> on the actions the EEOC has taken uh, at your time there. I think you've been really clear about how this issue has shown up on your, on your roadmap. But given that EEOC is an agency that's rooted in the March in Washington and the federal enforcer of workplace and anti-discrimination law, how do you how do you see the EEOC's how, how's it been navigating these issues and and adapting to the age of AI? And I'd I'd really like top of mind certainly as you mentioned guidance. We heard a, a little bit about guidance from in the previous panel. Also the the release that went out with sort of the alphabet soup of agencies, including the EEOC. I'd love I'd love to if you could share about kind of how you see those unfolding and what the future might hold. So I've tried to simplify it because you know, my background is a labor and employment lawyer. I don't understand technology. I don't understand how any of this works, right? But you can sort of get lulled into this, like, you know, wow, look at this unbelievable results you know, that we're getting. And that's the key word I focus in on, results. Because if we try to regulate the technology at the EEOC, maybe unlike other agencies, we are going to lose. Do you know why? Because our investigators don't have the training on how to see what an algorithm looks like, to how to go through and parse out some of this various code behind the scenes. And I've been arguing none of that matters, because you know what we do know is we know employment decisions. And at the end of the day, until one of these tools comes out and suddenly reinvents how an employment decision making is, occurs, we just need to take a step back and say, what are we asking this to, tool to do? Are we asking it to review resumes? Are we asking it to make hiring decisions? At the end of the day, there's going to be some result from that action. And that result, based on employment decision making, is what the agency has been regulating since 1960s. So that's why I try to focus away from the technology, technology, away from regulating the algorithms themselves, because as you've heard probably throughout, and from the congressman's remarks, if, if we want to start getting in that game, we're going to need a lot more funding. We're going to need a lot more training. We're going to need different kinds of investigators. But that's not why my agency was created. Our agency was created to prevent and remedy employment discrimination and advance equal employment opportunity. And that's what we do. And how do we do that? By looking at the results. And fortunately, the way Title VII of the Civil Rights Act is designed, that, that's what we regulate. And it doesn't matter who made the employment decision. The employer is going to be liable. So if it was an AI tool or a human with bias, the liability is going to be the same either way. So that's where I'm starting from, the point saying, well, that's our strength. That's what we know. And in a sense, if an algorithm does make a tool, uh, make a decision with bias in it, well, now, what is the next step going there? Because if you look at now, if, if somebody complains of employment decision, I wasn't hired because of my race, because of my age. What do we do now? We show up. And we have to interview the hiring manager through depositions or subpoenas. And we say, did you not hire this person because she was a woman? Did you not hire this person because they were old? And nobody ever admits to employment discrimination. Nobody says, of course, I have bias. I would never hire a woman for this job. It's just not that easy to begin with in our investigations now. And now, you know, if algorithms or data or machine learning is involved in the equation, I've been arguing this can actually help us with our investigations because now you potentially have an audible and traceable trail outside determining what the numbers of the algorithms and saying, well, what were the inputs here? Opposed to the inputs of somebody scribbling notes on a notepad saying, looking for discrimination during an interview, because that's generally all we have, versus you know, uh, having a data set. And what does a data set mean in HR? Your applicant pool. 
you know, having the actual points that the algorithm was looking at, what does that mean in HR? The skills to see if you have the job and not protected characteristics. We're able then to, in a way, have a much more transparent, audible, traceable, all those buzzwords in doing employment discrimination investigations that we didn't have before. But again, that's all dependent on the results, which is what we know how to investigate. So I've really been focusing it there. What are you using the tool for in HR? What purpose are you using for? And what are those results? And in a way now, they're much more traceable, but they're also auditable in advance, which, you know, as you know, a lot of the states and foreign governments are going to. Yeah, it's interesting because I think the way that we think about that is um, that you hear the ter term when it comes to public policy of, of technology neutral. Um, you know, given Workday's been involved in the HRAI space for a decade. Uh, I think we were pretty comfortable in, in our talking points right up until November of a, a year ago when all of a sudden generative AI came out and it sort of shifted everything. And who knows what's going to happen sort of, you know, next November or the November after that or the November after that. So really focusing on on a technology neutral uh, approach makes some sense. I want to... Um, I want to take a moment of, of a personal privilege, and uh, as the as the fireside chat e, um, <clears throat> can you talk just for a second about the tools at the EEOC's disposal? So so clearly um, there was some guidance that came out. Um, obviously there are enforcement actions. I think there's there's some rulemaking authority. Is that I mean like how are you thinking about taking kind of your focus on these issues into how does that get, translate into into employer behavior? You know, for me, I just try to compare it to what HR departments are doing for the same employment decision making that's occurring outside algorithms. And you know, think about now, you know, corporations have very significant HR training. If you've all, you know, when you've started your job, you have to watch all those videos, you have sexual harassment training, you have policies and procedures related to you making hiring decisions and being an employee. And that's what needs to occur related to AI governance, you know, both at the macro level and the micro level. And that's really what I've been arguing for from my position. You know, at the macro level, and I've talked a lot about setting your principles. So going back to the when the Me Too movement occurred, what happened? Every CEO came out, every board came out saying, this is not, we are not an employer that's going to sexually harass. We are not an employer that's going to discriminate. And if you feel like you're sexually harassed, you can report it and something will happen. And I think that's what needs to happen with AI governance. And a lot of companies like Workday, Microsoft, IBM, Salesforce have come out and put these very broad principles of corporate use of AI. So that's step number one when it comes to governance. And then step number two is the more micro for the specific use, like in HR. And you know, there's so much tools that we've provided about how the Americans with Disability Act impacts um, disabled workers who are going to be subject to these algorithms, how can, you can use longstanding employment testing principles from the 1970s on any type of AI tool that you're going to be using as an employment assessment. And what I've been really arguing for is saying you have all these existing policies like I just mentioned, but now you need to create and amend those related to AI. And you need to signal to your employees and your applicants that, you know, if we are going to be using this, we are going to be using this under the same longstanding principles, which are rooted in civil rights laws um, related to worker protection, re related to worker rights. And that could be ensuring that people who have access to this algorithm, have access to the programs, you know, have that proper training by the vendor, working with the vendor to make sure that you know, when you're looking at these programs that you can't sift it through age, you can't sift it through gender or any characteristics that may show you're of this protected um, class. And if you do, you're fired you know, to protect the company from using it, just like you would fire somebody who sexually harasses somebody. So I think we need to take, and what I've been trying to do with the EEOC is saying, here's all of our existing guardrails, laws when it comes to employment decision making. Because AI tools are simply doing that at scale, you need to have those same policies amended and drafted related AI governance, because if something does go wrong, you can at least show that you are doing everything you can to prevent discrimination from occurring. And that's what we were gonna look at first and foremost. And that is sort of you know the way these products are sold in AI across the board, as you all know. It's SaaS software, implement it as quickly as you can. Look at all the money you're gonna save. Look at all the employees you're gonna displace. Look how wonderful, there's gonna be no bias, no discrimination. And, and if you do that in the HR space, you're going to be in significant trouble because there's just you're making decisions about people's livelihoods, their careers, which are protected by fundamental civil rights. So that's where I've been arguing that this stuff can all work, and it actually can do it if it's, it's promised. But there's just so much more that has to go through it in the HR space. And that's not only the cost of buying the software, 
But the cost of that governance, building in the policies, the testing, the making sure that before it ever makes a decision, that there is no bias. And there's a lot of tools under existing laws that we put out that can show you how to do that. So it can all work, but there's just a lot of extra care in the HR space um, that most individuals who deal with software implementation haven't had to deal with before. And I think that's the difference here of how we make it work. I think uh, you've, you've covered a little bit about this, but there is, Workday spends a lot of time talking to policymakers about HR, about AI, about safeguards. And there is this sense somehow that, that all of these tools are being developed in a vacuum, that there's no existing regulatory framework, that there's no existing, you've been very clear, and I wanna give you a, a platform to be clear here, that when it comes to both developing and deploying AI in the HR space, there are existing employment laws that cover these uses. Correct, and, you know, and I, I say that, and what's even trickier in the HR space under employment laws, whether you intended to discriminate or not, liability is gonna be the same either way. And that's really where that extra care and caution needs to be, because at the end of the day, you're just making an employment decision. Only the employer can make the employment decision, not the AI vendor. And that's really what we can't lose focus on. And I think what we're starting to see is a lot of distraction out there related to certain cities or states or even foreign governments start to regulate in this space, specifically related to HR. Now, New York was the first, uh, um, city, New York City was the first one to put out a comprehensive called Local Law 144 related to using AI and HR. There's proposals in California, AB 331, that talk about some of the additional requirements they're gonna have, such as employee consent, disclosure, opting out, yearly audits. The EU has designated some of the um, uses of AI and HR as higher risk, which is gonna have those significant disclosure requirements. So that is really all in addition to these underlying principles. So you can't get lost in the sense we're saying, well, in New York City, I'm gonna have to do a yearly bias audit, or in California, I'm gonna have to give disclosures. That's all things employers can be doing now because if you look about how you actually do those bias audit testings, those yearly testings, it's based upon the EEOC principles of um, employment uh, testing. So a lot of that really comes back to our agency, even some of these new innovative laws are restricting it. And you know, it gives sort of employers who operate on a multi-state or multinational level kind of uh, almost options that they could start integrating now, saying, well, if this is where all these governments are going, for employee consent or yearly bias audits. If you do the yearly bias audits and find bias before it's deployed and actually eliminate that bias, then you're not gonna have liability with the EEOC either because there's no discrimination. So I think it's really important to watch that, but we can't lose sight that there's the EEOC is already there um, in all these areas that are trying to regulate in this space. And that's gonna have to be the last word. One of the downsides of you and I getting on a podium is that it can take uh, all day to get to the end of the conversation. So please help me uh, thank the uh, Commissioner Sonderling for coming and um, I appreciate your time.